So when people start to tell you about the church is not this and the church is not that, just reminding them that God is the head of the church. And I always tell people when they tell me about, well, you know, the church, those church folks, I said, if you've got a complaint, take it up with the boss. If you got an argument or a complaint, take it up with the boss. They said, well, what, who are you? I mean Jesus. He's the boss. So if you got a complaint about the church or anything that's going on, take it up with him. You're wasting your breath on me because I, you know, I'm just going to do what the Lord tells me to do. You take it up with Jesus. Amen? Amen. So it's important that we recognize that. Um, as his brothers were praying earlier, one of them had, uh, in his prayer, was talking about, but precious brother here, about if Christ be not risen. If Christ be not risen. And it's interesting he said that because I was saying that to myself this morning. If Christ be not risen, our religion is in vain. In vain. Our preaching is in vain. Our believing is in vain. But because he lives, because he rose again, we have a right, amen, come on, we have a privilege to be able to worship the true and living God. I am so grateful that he rose. I'm grateful that he rose because if he had not rose, I would be in bondage. If he had not rose, but he rose to bring us liberty. So we have liberty in Christ because he rose. And I'm so grateful for the resurrection every day that because he rose, I have new mercies every morning. I'm, I, I'm just excited every morning because he rose. Because I know that no matter what type of defeat tries to come my way, there's victory in Jesus. And I know that throughout our lives, our daily commute in life, we have tribulations. We have tests, we have trials, we have things that want to dissuade us and persuade us that life is not all that great. But I, I beg to differ with you. The Bible says I came that you might have life and that more abundantly. But not only that. I think that what I had to learn as a Christian was that my hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. And what that means to me is that this temporal life, temporal life, temporary life is really not all there is to it. Now, I have a lot of friends of mine that when I tell them that I'm living to live again, you know, uh, some of you heard of D.L. Moody. He was a great uh, preacher back in the, in, in the day. He used to say these the same. He used to say, if you hear people tell you that I'm dead, don't believe them. He goes, I might not be on here, but he said, I'm somewhere else, and I'm alive. More alive than I've ever been. And so when I learned the importance of not clinging to this life, when I learned the importance of not just getting hung up, see, that's why Jesus said the statement that he made about rich people entering to heaven. You know, some of you all have, have seen this happen time and time again where rich people get into trouble and they pull out a lot of bucks to get out of trouble. They pay a lot of money to get out of trouble. Well, that's what happens. They trust in their riches. Their riches is their God. But thanks be to God that my God is in glory. And it's not about how much money I have. And, and, and when I learned, and they used to say this when I was a kid, they used to tell me, they used to say, where this world like a loose garment. And I didn't understand that when I was a kid. Well, what do you mean? Wear this world like a loose garment. Because you don't want to hold on to this. You don't want to cling on to this. You don't want this to be the, the, the only thing. I hear people all the time say, man, this is it for me, man. If I don't make it here, man, this is it. This is it. I got to get money. I got to get cars. I got to get riches. I got to get... And, and it's sad because that's their existence. They don't go beyond that. They don't see beyond that. But when God gives me a glimpse beyond that, beyond this life, beyond this world, beyond this existence, knowing that I have a Savior. Paul said to live is Christ, but to die is gain. So when Paul makes that statement, he understands the importance of being with Christ. Now, I'm not saying that in this life we shouldn't have joy. Because he says, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world have peace. There's peace and there's joy in this world. But understand that when you're going through tests and trials and tribulation, you're going to live again. And it reminds me of the book of St. John, the 11th chapter. Got a lot of pencils up here. <laughs> right, one <want a> pencil? St. <laughs> John, the 11th chapter, and...
And Jesus was talking about Lazarus. Now, Lazarus was a very close friend of Jesus, and, and it's interesting how people didn't understand the concept of what Christ was trying to relate to them. Even the disciples were confused about what Christ was saying. And, and there were times when Jesus spoke in parables, but there were times where he just had to come out and say, listen, Lazarus is dead. Because they weren't getting it. They were talking about Lazarus being asleep, and, he said, and they said, well, if Lazarus is sleeping, then he's doing well. He's probably resting somewhere. And they still wasn't getting the concept. But the 11th chapter says, now, a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Now, at this point, and I love this, this passage of scripture because at this point, Jesus got the message that his friend was, was sick. And it's interesting to note that we as Christians don't realize that when we're going through that God has already got the message. And as many of us in our, in, our, in our trials and tribulations in our life, we say, God must not be hearing me. I'm still going through this thing. I'm still going through changes. I still have pain in my body. I'm still going through financial issues. I'm still going through God must not have gotten the message. But I want to let you know something. He got the message. But why, why then did Jesus not move when, when he got the message? There he was, his friend. He, Lazarus was a friend of his. And they said, Lazarus is sick. And Jesus still hung out for a couple of days and didn't go anywhere. And it's interesting to note that in that passage, the symptom, I love it how it was because when Jesus finally got to where he was supposed to go, one of the sisters was kind of upset. She said, you know, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. If you had been here. But then she got, came to her senses but, and said, but I know who you are. I know that you have power. And see, in our lives, we know that God is able to do things in our lives. And sometimes we wonder within ourselves, where is God in my suffering? Where is God in my situation? Where is God when I'm going through? And trust me, many of day I have, I have prayed myself and felt like God was nowhere to be found. But see, this is the interesting thing about the, the, the salvation way. The Bible said we should walk by faith and not by sight. And here's the thing. There are many days when I've said, God, it seems as if you're not even hearing me. But I know that your word says that your ears are inclined to the prayers of the righteous, to the saints. So because your word says it, your word says it, I'm going to believe him. It may not appear in this particular situation that you're here or that you're hearing me. And trust me, sometimes I would lay on my bed and I would pray all night. And the very next day, I get up and I feel like I've accomplished nothing. But that's why I don't live by faith, by feeling. I walk by faith. If I were to live by how I felt on a daily basis, I would not be standing here. If I were to live, there were times when I would, come, would go to work and could barely speak because of, of, of the condition in my, in my throat sometimes. I wouldn't even go, you know, I get on my job and I, sometimes I try to talk on the phone and I could barely talk. Are you all right over there? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm fine because I believe God. I believe God, but we come sometimes to a situation where it feels like God is not hearing us. And here it is that... They're talking about it, and he said, when Jesus heard that he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified therefore. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and, and, and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days in the same place where he was. Then after that says, 
he unto his disciples, let us go into Jerusalem again. Now, he said to the disciples, this sickness is not unto the death, so that they can catch on. He already knew this, so that they can catch on. But they still hadn't caught on. They still wasn't getting, what's going on here? Had they got it, they would have said to him, well, wait, if Lazarus is asleep, he's doing good. I, he just said, this sickness is not unto death. And then he told them that Lazarus was asleep. They weren't just grasping the concept. And sometimes we don't grasp the concept in God. That what you're going through in your life is for the glory of God. It's for God to be glorified. It's for God to be magnified. And it may not always appear that way. It may not always appear that way. This is why, like I said, I, I'm not concerned about what the outward looks like or how it feels. It's by what the word of God says. It's merely by the word of God. I'm going to skip a few verses. Jesus answered, therefore, there's 12 hours in the day. If any man walk in the day, he stumbles not because he's seen the light of this world. But if a man walk in night, he stumbles because there is no light in him. And in our daily walk as Christians, we have to learn to trust God. We have to learn to walk in the right. And I'm telling you something. Trusting God doesn't always mean it's going to go the way you think it's going to go. It doesn't mean that. It means that in no matter what I go through, how insurmountable the situation is, or however God desires for it to go, I still trust him. You know, the Hebrew boys, they were good at that. Because they said to the, the uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, they said, they, listen, 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 listen. Let me explain something to you. And they wanted to make it plain to him. They said, we know that God is able to deliver us. But if he doesn't, he's still able. And he let him know that it doesn't matter what you say. We're not going to bow. We're not going to conform. So go ahead and do what you got to do. But I want to let you know something. God is able to deliver us. And if he doesn't deliver us, we already know he's still able. And see, this is the attitude and the mindset that we as Christians have to have daily. Doesn't matter what the bill collector says. It doesn't matter what they say. Doesn't matter the prognosis of the doctor. I'm not concerned about any of those things. I'm merely concerned about what the Bible says. The, what the word of God says. It's what the word of God says. Day in and day out, the devil is a liar. The Bible says that he's an accuser of the brethren. It, it, was, it, was, it, it was evident and notable in the book of Job, when the Bible says that the sons of God presented themselves before God and Satan came also. Have thou beheld my servant Job, like there's none like him in the world. Now, what, here's the question that I love. God said to Job, where are you coming from? He said, from back and forth in the earth and up and down. Have you beheld my servant Job? Yep, I saw him. Why? Because he's got his eye on you. He constantly has his eye on you. That's why the Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. His very next statement was, if you take the heads from around him, he'll curse you to your face. That was his very next statement. That was his very next statement. The devil watches you daily. is looking for you to trip up. Looking for you to walk in unbelief. But let me tell you something. The devil has no ability, no power over you. People always say, oh, the devil's the devil. Why stop talking about the devil? He's got no power over you. None whatsoever. He has the power of suggestion. That's it. Any other inch he gets, you give him. Am I right about it? Any other inch in your life, you give him. He has no power. Power of suggestion. You can say, well, you know what? You're sick. Then you start going, <coughs> you know, it could be terminal. <laughs> The next thing you know, you're in the bed, you got the thermometer in your head. People going, how you doing? Not so good. Not so good. And that all came from a suggestion. The thing about that, like I said before, is he has no power over you. Now, I'm not saying that sickness don't come. Not saying that. I'm not saying people don't get sick. I'm saying, you know, it's interesting. My, my, we were, me and a friend of mine were talking. We were talking about Patrick Swayze. Some of y'all may know who he was. And I remember when Patrick Swayze uh, got sick. Now, before Patrick Swayze was diagnosed with his sickness, he looked fantastic. And I, and I noted this. He looked great. The minute the doctor told him he was sick, it took two weeks he lost 20 pounds. That quick. Why? Because the first thing he did was let it get in here. <sighs> oh, my God. I'm not going to 
make it. And when we allow the enemy to defeat us here, he goes from here to here. When he goes here, it comes out of here. And when you start confessing defeat, 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 you are defeated. The Bible said you shall have whatsoever you say. You shall have whatsoever you say. And you say, preach, I don't think it's that, it's that simple. Yes, it is. The Bible said life and death are in the power of the tongue. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Huh? So I choose life. So if I choose life, I confess life. Amen? If I choose life, I constantly confess life. I say that I am the victor and not the victim. People say, well, you know, I've hearing this, I've been hearing this all my life. And have you been practicing all your life? That's the point. We know that. I mean, that and, and trust me, I'm guilty of it too. When situations get mad, sometimes we want to mumble. We want to do like the children of Israel. You know, I, I, I love their story. And I laugh at some of their, their instances. When they got to the Red Sea, the first thing they did was look at Moses and say, we ought to kill you. You have the nerve to bring us out of here. We was in Egypt. We were fine. Now you bring us out here to die. That's the first thing they said. How dare you? You bring us out here to drop dead. And, 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 and Moses was like, really? <laughs> really? All the miracles that you saw in Egypt? All the things that God did you, and that's the first thing you said. And he looked at God, well, really, and God said, what are you looking at me for? What's in your hand? Stretch up your rod. And sometimes that's how we got to behave as Christians. You got to stretch up the word of God. The Bible says, and it's interesting because Jesus said it to Satan. He said, it is written. It is written. It is written. Our victory, is, as the pastor was saying, is in our sword, and our sword is the word of God because it was takes us, us to heaven. This is what we stand on, God's word. We stand on the truth of God's word every day, knowing that God's word brings victory to our lives. I know it doesn't feel that way all the time, but guess what? It works. It never fails. Jesus never fails. The Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. He does not fail. God doesn't fail. He doesn't change. He's a God of victory and not of defeat. God has never lost a patient. He has never lost a battle. He is the victory. He is the great I am. He is the great counselor. He is the everlasting father. He is the prince of peace. Hallelujah. He never lost a battle. You're not serving a losing God. Come on, somebody. But you're serving the victor, the God who have the stars in the heaven. He is the great I am. Hallelujah. He told Gideon, he says, listen, you don't even need all the folks you got. Cut it down, cut it down. You don't even need all of them. You don't even need all of them. Just a few. Because I'm doing the work anyway. Right? Uh, he told the children of Israel, march around the, the, the walls of Jericho. How does a shout make a wall fall down? Through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Huh? How does a shout bring victory to your life? Hallelujah. When you're alone at home, amen, and the devil seems like he's getting the victory, and you say, glory to God. I thank you, Jesus, because I know that you have given me the victory, irregardless as to what it seems like I'm going through. And when you begin to give God that shot and that praise, that situation has to begin to come down, because it is God that gives victory. It is God that gives you the victory. Amen. And because we know that, we stand on his word. Somebody said, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. And I persuaded no matter what happens to your economy, who you have in the White House, if they say yay, if they say nay, I am serving a God who has a cattle on a thousand cattle on the hill. And I am serving the great I am. So it doesn't matter. You know, people tell me, you know, it looks pretty bleak. Because Donald Trump in the White House, it doesn't look good. They said, he's not the Savior. What are you talking about? If your hope is built in Donald Trump, then you lost already. But if your hope is built, and see, that's one of the things that I, I, I love about the Bible because there are two Hebrew terms. One that's called Moshiach, the other Mishiach. The two differences of those two words, even though they sound similar, is this. When Jesus came, 
The Jews were looking for Moshiach, meaning they were looking for a ruler or a king who would bring down the Roman Empire. They were not concerned, but he came as Moshiach. He came as the Savior who came to save the sins of the world. He came as a loving God who came to bring us and reconcile us back to the Father. Hallelujah. And I'm going to tell you something. Being reconciled to the Father is where the victory lies. Amen. But see, the Hebrews didn't understand that at the time. That being reconciled to God is where the victory lies. And I'm so grateful that Jesus came and reconciled me to the Father. For the Bible says, now I can go boldly to the throne of grace in my time of need. I can go before God right now in whatever circumstances I'm sitting here. It reminds me of Hezekiah. The Bible says that Hezekiah in the Isaiah the 38th chapter was sick unto death. And the prophet told him, set your house in order, you will die and not live. Oh, but I want to let you know something. The Bible says as the prophet began to leave, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall. And he began to talk to God. Now God, I be your faithful servant. I've done this and you remember me, oh Lord. And the Bible said that before the prophet could leave the court, God said, go back. And tell the king, go back and tell the king that I've heard his prayer. I've heard his cry. And I'm going to add 15 more years to his life. Hallelujah. Now, and I want to let you know, God remembers your cry. Come on, son. He remembers your sins. God remembers you. And he knows the tears that you've cried and the things that you've done in the service of the Lord. Sometimes we got to turn our face to the Lord. Now listen here, Lord. I remember Moses when he was out in the wilderness. God said, look here, Moses, I'm about to destroy these people. Get out of my way. I'm going to destroy them. And Moses said, look here, God. <laughs> you didn't bring them all the way out here to kill them. Now repent of this thing and let's move on. God said, okay, Moses. Let's do this thing. And I want to let you know sometimes we just got to remind God. I'm not telling you that he doesn't know. But sometimes we got to remind God. Listen, Lord. I've been your faithful servant. I've loved you, Lord. And I've not turned to the left. I've turned to the left. Now I need you in my circumstance. I need you in my situation. I need you to show up, Lord, in my life. I'm going through a ride down here, Lord. And it seems like no one understands my pain or understands what I'm going through. And I want to let you know something. Sometimes people will not understand. Sometimes people will not understand. But the Bible says, and I love it because it's true. He is a high priest that can be moved with the feelings of your infirmities. Forget about trying to explain to everybody else what you're going through. Talk to Jesus. Because huh? not everybody going to know what you're going through. Not, not everybody will empathize or sympathize with you. But there's one, the Bible says, who is tempted in all men huh? and understands everything you're going through. Huh? He understands you're rising up and you're laying down. Huh? You're going in, you're coming up. God no, understands everything you're going through. Huh? And if you turn your face to the Lord, say, listen, Lord, I'm not. Like Hezekiah said, I've been your servant. Now I need you, God to move in my life show up in my life hallelujah the bible said Elijah was subject to life passions and he prayed earnestly come on somebody the bible said the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man I tell you something if you turn your face to the world and talk to God I'm going to let you know something that he will hear your humble cry hallelujah hallelujah he'll hear your humble cry I am grateful because I recognize the difference between Moshiach and Mishiach. I'm, def I'm def grateful because I recognize that he came to save a wretch like me. When I was sitting here on the front pew, I was just in my mouth, and God just said to me, God's love, God's love, God's love. He said it to me as I was sitting here, for God so loved the world that he gave. Come on, somebody. His only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Not a time to perish, but it's a time to live. It's not a time to die. It's a time to declare God as your victory and your savior. Hallelujah. Amen. Shake them off. Shake them off. Hallelujah. I declare victory in the camp. Hallelujah. I declare victory in the camp. Come on. I'm a warrior. Glory be to God. And I declare victory in the camp. If all I can do is stop my feet every now and then. If I can't stand up, if I could just tap my foot every now and then, that's a type of victory. I'm letting the devil know I serve notice on you. I am not a victim. I am the victim. Hallelujah. I am the victim. The Bible says, 
said, and this is the victory that overcometh the world. My faith in him. That's the victory that overcometh the world. If you could just believe God. It was one blind man said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. I believe, Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus said, if you can believe, come on. All things are possible to him that believe. He said, with man, these things are possible. But with God, all things are possible to them that believe. If you could just believe God, all things are possible. Hallelujah. Amen. There's a little more to the sermon, but I'm going to shut it up now. But I want to let you know something. That amen. Jesus said to me, I am the resurrection of the life and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. He is not just a God. Come on, somebody. Lazarus was already dead. So it proves the point. He was the God of the living and of the dead. Hallelujah. He told Lazarus, he said, come forth, Lazarus. And sometimes in your circumstances and situations, you think I'm coming to the end. But as you begin to think you're coming to the end, God speaks to your circumstance. and says, come forth. Come alive in your situation. Come alive in your circumstance. Come alive in your ministry. Come alive in your service to the Lord. It ain't time to give up yet. We have just begun. We are warriors in the kingdom of God. And we have just begun the fight. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Amen. It's not crying time. Huh? It's praising time. Hallelujah. It's glorifying God time. Hallelujah. Amen. We thank God for victory in the house. Hallelujah. Because that what Christ has given us is victory and not defeat. God bless you today. Amen.